Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. And for lecture in fish and wildlife, um, or for this lecture in fish and wildlife, we are going to discuss marking techniques. So last time we talked about capturing techniques. And so we went over things like passive techniques, active techniques, things that could be both passive and active, depending on how the individual deploys the technique, okay? things that are going to be lethal, non-lethal. We covered a whole bunch of capturing techniques. Now, clearly, when we're talking about marking techniques, we're interested in mainly keeping the organism alive. There's a purpose to, uh, you know, applying this mark and, um, and then getting information back at a later date. Now, I would, I guess I could say that it depends on, the mark you use depends on what kind of data you want from that research or from that organism. So there are really two types of marks. Now, I'm not saying that some of these marks cannot be used in different ways, but the typical application of the mark is what I'm going to present, and then I'll also talk about some of the marks and how you could use them in a different way. All right, for example, here's you know here's a marking technique over here on the left. Um, you can see that a little bit of paint or a little bit of dye is being placed in the kind of dorsal fin of this fish. That's called the elastomer dye or elastomer paint. It's it's kind of like a, a rubber-based paint um, that is used to kind of dye fish, um, or you can you can dye other organisms just as long as their skin um, is fairly transparent. You can see the dye underneath. Now there are reasons that you might use this if you're interested in just um, examining a batch of organisms. So maybe you've captured a bunch of organisms at one point in time. So you give all those organisms a single mark, uh, like a batch mark or an elastomer tag, okay? and then you can release those organisms, come back at a later date, collect all those organisms or new organisms, and see how many of them have that batch. That tells you, and you can use that as a mark recapture study, and that can allow you to make population estimates. And that's often done with simple things and cheap material like elastomeric tags. On the right is a much more expensive tagging method, but it's much more valuable if you want to collect data for a long period of time um, and, you know, different types of data. So this is going to be a GPS tracker, okay, and it is glued on the back of this organism here, but sometimes, you know, uh, they come with other methods, like you can put a harness on the organism. Sometimes they're embedded in the organism, so you have to do surgery and you cut the organism open and you place it in the cavity of the organism and sew it back up. There's a lot of different methods to applying these um, types of marks or these types of tracking devices. But the device itself will tell you a lot more about the organism than say an elastomeric tag. Often it will tell you where that organism is at a given point in time. There are ways at which you can set these. You can set them to ping to a satellite. In this case, this is a satellite G GPS tracker. So it'll ping to its signal to a satellite. And you can track them. If you really wanted, you could track them every minute of the day. Okay. Now, the more pings it sends, the less the battery um, is going to last or less time the battery is going to last. So often people are interested, well, maybe every few days, maybe every once a week, um, depending on how long you want the tracking device device to last will depend on kind of what you set that to.
There are tons of other information that you can get from these devices too, though. Um, so the sophisticated GPS devices will tell you, in this case, since this is a marine animal, it could tell you the depth that the organism was or how deep that organism on average is traveling. It could tell you the temperature of the water. It can tell you um, the time of day. Um, it can tell you the speed the organism is traveling. Uh, I mean, there is just a, a huge amount of data that you can get from different trackers. Now, there's also a huge amount of work. This is quick and cheap, okay? Maybe a penny to mark a single individual, okay? Here, we might be talking $1,000, $2,000 for a single tracking device. Now, price really depends on how many bells and whistles, what kind of bells and whistles do you have, okay? And so we'll talk more about these marking techniques um, and the value of the marking technique really depends on the study. What do you want from the organism? What do you want um, from that technique? And how important is that data? Okay. So again, I would say that there's two kind of marking techniques, generalized marking techniques. Those are batch marks or individual marks. There are two other types of marking techniques, okay? And that is external marking techniques versus internal marking techniques. Okay? And we'll go through these and I'll talk more about these, these different types of techniques. Okay? So from an external point of view, you have things like flesh removal. I'll, I'll go into detail about this, but you can remove like a digit or a piece of flesh from the organism that causes permanent mark on the organism. You can add something like a Floyd tag. That's what these are here. Sometimes they're called T tags. Okay. And the number or this piece goes inside, but the tag itself is external. Okay. So the tag is hanging off the organism. These are used for fish, typically. You can use straps or bachelor buttons. Okay. Now these are all external presenting tags, but often. Um, involve some kind of puncturing of tissue and it's like an earring or um, an operculum uh, cover will be punched and a bachelor button will be stuck on it or um, lots, lots of places to put these. Okay? But at any rate, it's often kind of as permanent as it can be from the standpoint of eventually it will fall off. Um, or eventually it might be torn off, that kind of thing. <clears throat> branding, um, there's lots of types of branding. The most common ones are you know, heat brands, which most of you are fairly familiar with. If you've ever you know, been around cattle and things like that, often they'll get heat branded. But there's also cold branding or sometimes called freeze branding. Um, and some ranchers use freeze branding also. Um, or instead of hot branding, um, it, it's, I don't know, it just depends on the organism and it depends on what, how elaborate you want the brand to be and how many organisms you're branding at one time. Now, branding itself is not common in wildlife, but there has been some research done on things like um, freeze branding of amphibians um, that it it seems to do uh, a fairly good job of holding the band and the brand the the mark holding the mark without damaging the tissue so much that the organism gets fungal infections and things like that okay. banding we've kind of talked about this already a little bit um, banding is the most common method for birds is to put a metal band on the bird after you've captured them um, and that's basically like a ring with a number on it that goes on their leg majority of the time for those birds that you can't band um, there is wing tags okay so for things like vultures and um, condors and other things that 
tend to defecate on their legs and um, also they tend to you know uh, stand in rotting flesh and things like that but mainly defecation on the legs will cause bands like metal bands to deteriorate okay? and the number will deteriorate over time there are other birds it's not just vultures and things like that that have the practice of you know defecating on their legs and I mean, some of the evidence suggests that this uric acid being on the legs prevents parasites and um, and other uh, biting insects from taking blood meals from that region of the, the organism. Okay, so let's look at some of these. So from external marking techniques in the case of clipping flesh off or taking a small chunk off it's very very common in invertebrates to do this okay whether that be um, crabs or lobster or crayfish other um, invertebrates it's often that you would take just a small section of um, the organ like organism's shell outer surface of the shell you just take a small chunk out of it okay when when we're talking about things like lobster and whatnot, these are often called V notches. And so they look like a V. Um, and depending on the organism, okay, lobster, and if you've ever fished for lobster or trapped for lobster, um, a V notched individual will often indicate that it's a female. Okay? So these are batch marks. It's not individually, it's not telling you anything about the organism except for that it's a female and that you should throw it back because these are the breeding population. So in this case, you can tell that this is a female. It has a bunch of eggs here and it's swimmerettes. Um, but it, let's say you captured it and it wasn't holding eggs and you saw the V-notch, then you would know that it's a female. Okay? And that's because lobster men um, and scientists have caught that organism it had eggs, so it V-notched it and dropped it back in. Okay, so then later date, someone else catches that organism. It's V-notched, okay, and maybe it doesn't have any eggs, but you return it anyways, okay? So <clears throat> there's lots and lots of ways to clip things. Now, in some cases, you're doing a, a, a batch mark to indicate that organism might be um, not a native organism. So if you've been fishing for salmon, especially in the Pacific Northwest, you'll see that um, if it's a native salmon, okay, the adipose will still be there. Okay? So the adipose is the fin between the dorsal fin and the caudal fin, and it's, it's not a true fin. It's kind of a projection of fat, hence the name adipose. But um, it looks like a fin. And in hatchery fish, those most of the time, those adipose are being clipped off, okay? And that indicates to the fisherman, hey, this is a hatchery fish. You can collect this fish or you can catch this fish and take it home. Especially on rivers that have native runs, the native fish are often not, you're, you're not allowed to keep native um, spawning fish, okay? So if it still has its adipose fin, you're supposed to release it um, under fine, and penalty if you do not. Now, there are lots of other ways that you can do fin clips too from um, a standpoint of other fish. So you can have individual marks at times by doing combination clips, okay? So maybe you clip the top portion of the dorsal fin and then the top portion of the caudal fin and then, you know, portion of the left um, pectoral fin. So there are ways in which you can do a combination of clips and get individual marks on fin clips. But most of the time, fin clips are used as a batch mark to indicate, hey, you know, all these organisms are, uh, they're hatchery, or all these organisms are female, or all these organisms were caught at one point in time. Toe clips used to be very popular in different fields of fish and wildlife still probably 
um, fairly co popular in the case of amphibian research. Okay? It's not so popular in mammal research anymore, but it used to be. And that is you would number the digits and you can number the digits in different ways, like maybe the front limb, left-hand side is, you know, ones. And then the right-hand side might be um, ones also. So that'll get you to 10. The back left-hand side might be in digits of 10. So the first, uh, you know, the pinky toe might represent 10 and then 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, or onto the other foot, or maybe it's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And then the other leg would be 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. Now, <clears throat> there's lots of ways at which these toe clips are numbered out, sometimes much more elaborate than that. Most of the time, people, though, only want to clip a single toe on each limb, okay? Because once you get up there and you start clipping two digits off the limb, you can hinder the organism's ability to move, okay? The other great thing about toe clips and why they haven't died out and some of these other mechanisms came about um, is that toe clips gives you a tissue sample and, you know, a DNA sample. And if it's in the case of things like amphibians or reptiles, you can use that toe not only for a DNA sample, but you can use the bone to get an age estimate. Okay? And we'll talk about um, estimating age and things like that in a, a later lecture. Okay? Tail clips, um, lots of things. Uh, you can just knock the tail off, clip the entire tail off of an organism. Um, you can do like a V-notch in this case. You can just clip the tip of the tail. Normally, these are batch marks to indicate something. Okay? All right, now some of the other external marks that can be batch marks um, but are often individual identification marks. So Floyd tags here, you can see a rainbow trout with a Floyd tag or sometimes called a T tag stuck. And so it goes right underneath often, okay, not always, but it goes right underneath the dorsal fin, okay, and it gets wedged in the spine. So in between two spines, and that's where that T sits, okay, so it can't be pulled back out. Now on that tag, there's an individual number. Now sometimes these are used as batch and individualized number. So the batch could be the color of the tag and the individual number would be catch catch that organism and read that number and that would tell you the individual's number. So that would tell you a lot of information like the size of capture um, or marking um, when it was captured, these kind of things. This is kind of a strap or a button um, tag here. Hey, these are ear tags for things like small rodents, but, you know, depending on the size of the organism, the tag can be, uh, you know, it's obviously um, size to whatever the organism is. Yeah, you're not going to put a tiny little tag in something like a cattle or a cow. You'd put a big tag so you can read it. But in something like a mouse or something like, something like that, you don't want anything to hamper the organism's ability to move, okay? Often in the world of marking organisms, we kind of have this rule of thumb or kind of rule in that the tag cannot weigh more than 10% of the organism. If it weighs more than 10% of the organism, you probably shouldn't put it on that organism because that would, in, you know, that would hamper the organism's ability to move. Okay. Which brings me to other types of tags like neck rings or neck tags. Okay. These used to be very commonly used in waterfowl, but now not as nearly as much because of the fact that a lot of waterfowl will feed under the water. Sometimes these will get tangled in vegetation and it will drown the organism. But it's also true for organisms that wade in the water with things like bands that go on their on their feet sometimes you know those bands will get hung up in vegetation and the organism will you know be stuck in the water and maybe drown that way 
Okay, so that's why wing bands were kind of invented. Was an alternative to the leg band and the neck band. Um, wing bands were invented, and you'll see things that don't accept neck bands and don't accept leg bands will often get a wing band. This is what you would stick on a condor or you know a, a vulture of some type because you don't want to stick a neck band because they're jamming their head into carcasses, and you don't want to stick a leg band on them because they you know deteriorate those. But other organisms like you know penguins and things like that will take wing bands better than leg bands. You don't want a leg band on a penguin because you know that's where they uh, hold their egg. And you don't want that band rubbing the egg, but you also don't want it because penguins' legs will often, um, their ankles will swell. And so they can rush blood into that region, especially when they're incubating. And that, you know, anything that constricts that region can be um, fairly, you know, detrimental to the organism. So you got to think about the marking technique before you use the marking technique. There's... Again, there's hundreds of marking techniques out there. Um, most likely something would work for whatever organism you're studying. <coughs> and so here, up in the corner here, you have a freeze brand. Okay, <clears throat> this would be, you know, very similar to something like a heat brand, except for instead of heat, it's, you know, ice cold that's being put on the organism, ice cold metal. <clears throat> Other things would be like paints, okay, in which you could, you know, actually paint a number on the organism, or sometimes you cut the hair or fur of the organism and then paint um, that. Sometimes it's just spray painted on them. It just depends on how long you want the, you know, material to last. Sometimes you dye the entire fur of the organism. There, there's lots and lots of techniques out there sometimes it's a batch mark just indicating that you've captured the organism other times it is an individual identification so like a number and sometimes it can be a little bit of both okay if you're creative enough and you have enough color patterns you can individually mark organisms with by using just like fingernail polish or paint um, in which you can, you know, have different marks for the head. Head might indicate um, the digit one and then, you know, white paint in the midsection might indicate the digit two or what, whatever it might be. And so if you knew if you use enough color patterns, you can get quite a bit of. Um, individualized numbers okay and individualizing or individually marking individuals <laughs> that's not proper english but um is ideal if you're going to do a mark recapture and collect things like growth rate or age at reproduction or if you're trying to find out what the diet of an organism is or where that individual is traveling okay that's very important if you're just examining populations or cohorts of organisms so maybe you got marked a bunch of organisms in 2010 and you want to see how many of them survive until 2019 there's no reason for doing individual marks on that just do a batch mark okay? a big batch mark and that holds over for eight years and then see what you got okay or maybe you're just interested in what the population is of a certain organism in a small lake or in a prairie or something like that so you can just mark organisms come back in a week recapture them see how many of them are marked okay do that again do that a few times and then you get this mark recapture situation where you now can use things um, like Mayfield's estimate and other types of estimates to um, estimate estimate how many organisms you have in a population. So again, the technique really depends on what kind of data you want. Okay, so let's talk about some internal techniques. And some of these 
are both internal and external or can be utilized in both situations. Okay, so you can have pigment marks. This is a lot like, <clears throat> you know, dyeing something or painting something, except for, like I said before, at the very beginning, you can use a technique called an elastomer tag or a, you know, a paint that is um, going to reflect a certain color under UV. Okay, and you can insert that into a region, okay, and then run a UV over it, and it should glow even much later in life, okay. You can, like, you know, you saw with the ants, if you have a bunch of different colors, you can do a different color pattern, and you can individualize these tagging techniques. Alpha numerical codes, okay, these are um, utilized constantly. Uh, in like salmon fisheries because the organisms at a very young age basically when they're fry or um in some cases even younger okay they are implanted implanted with a like coated wire tag okay and that coated wire tag has a certain number on it and so that individual fish is numbered okay and then that fish can be released and its adipose fin is clipped. And then if a fisherman catches that fish on a river, it's suggested, it's hoped that the individual will send the head back to the fishing game. The fishing game will crack the skull open, find the tag, read the number, and then they know, okay, that fish, you know, was released on this day. It made it the four years or however many years um it was supposed to make it in the ocean it was caught on this stream at this date etc okay alphanumerical codes are a lot like wire tags but sometimes they are just inserted right underneath the skin of an organism and you can read them under a microscope versus killing the organism now the coated wire tag is embedded in the rostrum of fish okay into the nostril or in between the nostril region kind of thing um and the organism when it's dead you can remove that you're not going to remove it otherwise okay um here i show you kind of another radio tracker again this is why i said these can be internal or external on uh, you know on this sea turtle it's going to be external but on something like a snake or something that's going to be going underground you often want to embed those inside the organism so some marks are both external and internal some other marking techniques internal marking techniques um, passive integrated tags or pit tags okay here you can see this is a passive integrated tag this is basically like um, the barcodes that occur on packages uh, so like if you've ever been to you know a department store or whatever and your barcode you know you walk through the little beeper and it goes off okay that's because that package was individually numbered okay and it sends a code to those you know um, readers same thing has been developed for animals in the form of passive integrated tags or pit tags and these are, you know, about the size, a little bit bigger than the size of a um, grain of rice. And it's basically an encapsulated glass bead that you inject under the skin of the organism. Here you can see this leopard frog being injected. Okay, but you can do it in a fish and things like that. Now, depending on the organism will depend on where you place it. Okay, and um fish that have an open uh reproductive system like salmon and things like that you should place it in the muscle tissue not in the cavity because sometimes they can um expel those when they're reprodu reproducing and they can kick those tags out at the same time okay radio tags um gps tags okay they're very similar to each other except for radio tags you're going out with a radio receiver and you're tracking them with a receiver gps tags are pinging off of satellites but you can see that, like i showed you 
you know, the sea lion picture at the very beginning, it's being glued onto the back of that organism. It was glued onto the, the sea turtle. But in the case of things like falcons and, and most birds, they wear a little harness. So there's a little harness that goes around um, their wings and it just sits on their back. This one's neat because this one has solar recharging ability. So the, that's one of the problems with GPS tags is that it's not that, that the GPS technology isn't going to last forever. It does. It's great. It works great. But the battery doesn't. So often you need a way to recharge that battery if you want to track that organism over multiple years. So um, researchers and, you know, technicians and things like that have developed solar um, chargers and things like that that can go on the backpack um, so the GPS tag can be used. Okay. Now the big one that we're not going to dive into in this lecture, but we probably will dive into um, in a, a lecture that's dedicated just to the genetics um, of fish and wildlife is genetics. Genetics, once um, the technology is there and everyone has a sequencer um, that's handheld and they can take into the field, then most of these techniques will no longer be needed. Okay, you could capture the organism, take a blood sample from the organism, run their genetics, okay, get an individual identification of that organism, and then at a later date, capture that organism again, run their genetics again. <clears throat> it's identical. You've already captured that individual, and now you have that data for that individual. Genetics can be huge. Not only can it tell you, um, again, that that's the same individual, but it can tell you a lot about that individual from, you know, growth rates based on genes, from disease prevention based on genetics, immune system function, these kind of things. Um, lots of things can be done with from a genetics point of view. We're not quite there, but we're moving in the right direction. We're getting closer and closer um, to being able to look at genetics uh, of lots of organisms at one time um, fairly, fairly quickly and fairly inexpensive. That's the big one with genetics. Um, it used to be very, very expensive. Now it's becoming much more uh, reasonable for fish and wildlife agencies to utilize genetics. They currently do it um, with poached organisms. So you poach a deer and you're um, caught, they will run the DNA of that organism and find out exactly where you poached that organism from. If you took it from a different state, okay? If you took it from a region that was closed um, or, you know, you shot an animal in, say, you shot an animal in Utah and you brought it across into Wyoming and, you know, for some reason, Game and Fish, you know, they looked at the organism and they're like, mm, I don't think that's a Wyoming organism. So then you just take a small tissue sample and find out, sure enough, okay, this organism's been, you know, in, you know, it was bred, raised, it's genetics match organisms in a different state, okay. And there's lots of ways that you can do that. Um, it's not just genetics of the organism itself, it's genetics of the plants that the organism was consuming. Um, there's lots of tag methods, okay, um, carbon dating or isotope dating. Um, can help with this. And we'll talk more about that as a technique um, for prevention of poaching and game movement and things like that at a later date. Okay, so that's the marking techniques that I want to describe to you. Again, you can expect some of these to be demonstrated in um, a video later to come where I show you um, a capture technique and the marking technique at the same time. Okay, so those videos are coming. Again, I have to wait for permits. I have to wait for, uh, you know, weather that uh, allows me to do these things, but th those videos are coming. Okay, till next time.